Thanks. Wow, it's um, really uh, been an amazing day, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, well, uh, maybe some of you recognize that emblem just before, the one that you see on sidewalks, actually, across this country. Um, it's, uh, you'll find it stamped in thousands of kilometers of sidewalks. And uh, if you recognize it, it's because it's from Canada's centennial year. It's the reason why I find myself in an incredible rush these days, because every time I walk over one of these on a sidewalk, I tend to speed up. Um, and the reason is that we're only eight years away from something which I think is very special, and it's the story that I'm going to tell. It's the story of how Canadians, how as Canadians, we're going to celebrate the 150th birthday of Confederation, Canada's sesquicentennial, uh, and what we can learn from what Pierre Burton famously, and maybe a bit mischievously, called Canada's last good year, the centennial in 1967. The reason I care about it and the reason I hope I can convince you to care about it too, is that 2017 may be our best opportunity, at least in the next decade, to do some important work in this country. So I want to do four things. I want to talk about 2017 in political terms. I want to talk about it in historical terms. I want to talk about it in terms of our sense of public imagination. And I want to talk about it in generational terms. But let's go back a sec, because it's important to ask why Burton called 1967 not just a good year, a great year, but the last good year. It's a title that actually got him into some trouble. Uh, because when the book came out in its second printing, the subtitle had been changed. 1967, the last good year, became 1967, Canada's turning point. <laughs> Which itself, let's be fair, is a provocative title, but it's certainly not as pessimistic, nor perhaps as poignant as his first. Now, partly it helps to know that Burton was writing in the mid-90s. The book was published in 1997, so Burton wasn't just writing in the immediate afterglow of the centennial year. He was writing it retrospectively and casting back 30 years later, just two years after the trauma of the Quebec referendum, and in the midst of the most serious cuts to public spending in at least a generation. And so in comparison to the 90s, the centennial era shone even brighter as a period of enormous political energy and public purpose. We can think of it a bit as a decade of change. I just want to go through very quickly, because it's easy to lose track of just how much happened in that nine-year period. In 1960, we got the Bill of Rights, and First Nations were given the right to vote. In 1961, we inaugurated the transatlantic phone system and the queen called our prime minister. But only a year later, we became the third country to put a communication satellite into space. And two years later, we started walking around with these social insurance cards in our pockets. In 1965, we saluted a new flag and Toronto opened a new city hall. And in 66, CBC flipped the switch on color. We got the Canada pension plan. The Bloor-Danforth line started to cut its way across Toronto. Montreal got Metro. And as Canadians, we got Medicare. In 1966, we sang a new anthem. We opened a national library. We began to award the Order of Canada. We attended this extraordinary World's Fair in Montreal, Expo. And 1,000 people came to see the first eight acts in Toronto's Carabana. But it continued, because in 1968, homosexuality was decriminalized, divorce was reformed, we started riding around on these double-decker green trains, came go transit, and the armed forces, the Navy, the Air Force, it was all amalgamated into the Canadian forces. And in 1969, we opened the National Arts Center in Ottawa, which, let me tell you, was every bit as important to the country in that generation as getting an opera house was to our own here in Toronto. And, of course, official languages came into effect. As a country, we started and ended the decade in very different places. It was an era of metamorphosis and reinvention. And by the end of the decade, you had public health care, a pension plan, and social insurance. You had new national symbols, institutions, and awards. You had better infrastructure. You could travel more easily and communicate more effectively in both official languages. And little of this was because of Centennial. 
But what Centennial did was establish a milestone, a goalpost. It was powerful because it focused everyone's attention on three questions. At 100, where are we? Who are we? And where are we going? And in this way, Centennial was a useful device. It had a political effect. It was catalytic because it gave us a public occasion to ask these questions in an open and free way, outside of the sort of public crisis that normally spurs these debates about radical change. Instead, the spirit of Centennial allowed us to propose some new ideas about how, as a society, we would live together. Or at least I think this is what two people, uh, Roby Kidd and Frida Walden, may have had in mind. Roby and Frida probably did more to shape the spirit of Centennial than anyone else, though I'm sure they probably refused the credit. Uh, Roby was the first Canadian to get a PhD in adult education. He was what you might call a, a proto-social entrepreneur. And Walden, she ran the Hamilton Public Library system, and so she saw firsthand the transformative power of literacy and education. Kidd and Walden each understood the value of what today is called lifelong, self-directed learning. And they shared the belief that a good society is one that encourages curiosity and self-discovery and improvement. And together, they were among the first people to recognize the opportunity that a Canadian centennial might contain. And I believe that in doing so, they helped to set the stage for what would follow. You see, 10 years before Centennial, before anybody else, in 1957, they organized a conference. And it drew together 32 different organizations. And a year later, they met again. And soon after, the Canadian Centenary Council was created. It was a voluntary organization whose purpose was to get people thinking about 1967 and press the government to get moving. Because it wasn't government that led the way to 1967. It was citizens, like Roby and Frida. And they managed to embed this idea that Centennial didn't belong to the government. It belonged to Canadians. And it would be up to Canadians to decide just how they intended to celebrate, encouraging curiosity, self-discovery, and improvement was what they hoped Centennial would help to do. They envisioned a Centennial that would be about the excitement of learning. It would be about learning about oneself, one's neighbors, and one's country. And you could do all of this without ever taking out a textbook. And what's so extraordinary is that when Canadians by the millions took up this invitation, exceeding anyone's expectations in Ottawa, and staged thousands of community events and initiatives, they began to see for themselves that despite their differences from one region to the next, what they shared was this desire to celebrate. And for Canadians, in 1967, it didn't matter if your idea of celebrating was to build a UFO pad in St. Paul, Alberta, <laughs> stage a bathtub race in BC, launch a Caribbean festival in Toronto, or a historic reenactment in PEI. <laughs> the point was the people were taking charge. They were spontaneously, joyously, rip, mixing, and burning centennials clear across the country. And if it was Expo, that extraordinary and visionary fair that created the most artifacts and affection and drew the most media attention and lodged in our minds this idea of global citizenship, citizens of the world with passports in hand, it was still these community initiatives that created the real sense of belonging to the country we call home. And inspired by Roby and Frida, the government got this. They understand that their job wasn't to lead but rather to convene. And let me show you what I mean by this. You know, we're so used to living with the syntax of government as a kind of mildly patronizing provider. You know, brought to you by the government of Canada, taking care of you and your hardworking family, that we've forgotten what simple, sincere communication can look like. Take a look at this ad. It says at the end, it's a time to reflect on our achievements of our growth into a modern, dynamic country and to look ahead. What are you planning for Centennial? You see, what Centennial had was this DIY 60s kind of steal this book ethic. In fact, the government actually took out ads asking people to steal, or rather to use the Centennial logo for anything they liked. It was effectively open source. So wear it, hang it, stencil it, carry it, wave it. But above all, please, just use it. 
Just try that with the Olympic rings. <laughs> you see, I think the real legacy of Centennial was that it gave Canadians permission to be imaginative and to do their own thing just at the same time so we could learn from one another. And you know, last year we watched an election in the US where the president challenged Americans to have what he called the audacity of hope. And I don't know if this scans quite as well in Canada because by and large Canadians have hope. But what we sometimes forget is the audacity of our imagination. Because it's always been this imagination, our commitment to fair play and our hard-headed northern attitude to mucking in and solving problems that makes Canada what it is. And as Canadians, I think we're at our best when we follow the logic of fair play and allow it to carry us to radical conclusions, when we use our imagination to push beyond old divides and create new conventions and commitments to one another. And I'd like to argue that in the run-up to 2017, we need to give ourselves permission to get imaginative as a country again. I'm a, I'm a bit stunned to give you this next example because it comes from a bank. <laughs> and it's not exactly your usual source of wild-eyed aspirational thinking. But just, just bear with me here because it says in, a, in its monthly newsletter, it says, you know, um, we've got cultural deficits. There are things that a country settled nearly 350 years ago and politically united 100 years ago. We should have this stuff by this point. We need stuff for the production of music and plays and ballets and all expressions of our artistic nature for the training and use of athletes for the development of minds through lectures, study groups, exhibitions, and TEDs. Instead of bronze plaques and marble monuments, we might unveil significant community improvements like new parks, new houses replacing slums, new city halls, new community buildings, libraries, and museums. And this is the most magical line. These are things we want anyway. And preparation for our centenary gives us the opportunity and incentive to get them now. You know, it's a bit startling to realize that a gray 1960s bank has something to teach us about thinking not only big, but about how we frame and imagine our collective aspirations. And today, as then, there's no shortage of opportunities and injustices to address. Some are in our backyard, and others are going to require wholesale political change and new institutional settlements. But my point, like the banks, is that the sesquicentennial is a good excuse for going after them. I want to quickly show you some, some posters, uh, in part because they're just they're so gorgeous. Uh, but they also do a good job of conveying this energy. And finally, this ad, which is almost earnest beyond belief. Uh, it says, in 1967, we learned a lot about ourselves as a nation. Let's not stop now. Let's enjoy this new knowledge of ourselves and make every year to come one of excitement and discovery. We'll just call it 1969, centennial plus one, and keep on going. You know. It has all of this incredible enthusiasm and tenderness about it, and we might almost be inclined to reject it because of that out of hand. But I actually think it's important to reject the idea that having any affection for this syntax, for this way of relating or describing public goals or shared purpose is somehow nostalgic or out of date. Instead, I actually think this is a challenge to us to take this syntax and way of relating and make it our own. You see, we might already now have a flag and an anthem in our first 150 years, we assembled all the pieces and built a country together. It's not a perfect one, but it's one that's ours, and it's ours still to shape. And by saying this, I'm tipping my hand to my final point. When I say that we need to think about 2017 in, in generational terms, I don't just mean the handover from baby boomers to their kids. That's happening, and it will, I hope, accelerate. What I mean <laughs> is... What I mean is that for Canada, in our first 100 years, geography was often destiny. But since, demography has been king. And it continues to reshape this country more radically than any other force. Just look at the growth of this country over the past 150 years. We'll be 10 times larger 150 years later. And each year, a quarter million new Canadians call this country home. 
we are now adding one million new Canadians to this country in the time that it takes to get a university degree. And we exceed any other country in the world per capita for the rate of this influx. And since 1967, fully one third of the country was born abroad. And today, I think most interestingly, 8% of our population lives abroad. And that's twice as many per capita as any other G8 nation. It's also more than the size of Atlantic Canada or the population of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and the North combined. Demography is destiny. But I'd contend that it's combining with our love of geography in radical new ways. We're the one country where when you recite the names of towns and cities across the length of six time zones, hearts flutter. You can try it. Whitehorse, Edmonton, Thunder Bay, Ramouski, Gander. And really, you feel something, even if you've never been to these places. <laughs> and yet, we now live in a time when to say the words Mombasa, Beirut, London, Hong Kong, Mexico City, stirs Canadian hearts as well. My point is that demography is actually expanding our geography, and with it, our sense of public imagination. It's changing how we will define our relationship with the state and our citizenship in the 21st century. And we are absolutely the right country to take this next step forwards. As it was in 1967, it may well be again. Global immigration and multiculturalism were once radical and new. And so it made sense to look more closely and discover and learn from where and how Canadians were living from one side of the country to the other. That was the centennial's overarching theme. But the reality of this legacy 50 years later is a new Canadian citizenry and a growing Canadian diaspora. Our citizens live and work abroad as never before. Circulation and multinationalism may seem as radical and foreign today as multiculturalism did in the 60s, but I'm willing to bet we will come to recognize them as a source of strength. And so, as in 1967, we need to look again at home and abroad and rediscover and learn from where and how Canadians are really living today. Or at least it's a good place to start. So what's next? Well, we need to get this show underway. Uh, next March, we've booked the National Arts Center for two days, and we're inviting 300 public servants, business leaders, scientists, artists, writers, performers, and we're going to get to work. It's the first major initiative to begin imagining and planning 2017, and believe me, you're all invited. And if you can't make it, then steal a page from the centennial, and today, create a 150X conference in your own community. <laughs> Just remember three things, OK? One, centennials belong to citizens. Together, we should use the sesquicentennial to ask those three powerful questions. Where are we? Who are we? And just where is it that we're headed? Two, without culture, politics is a spent force. You can't achieve anything meaningful in politics unless you've got people either singing or stomping for it. Because culture is the wellspring of our political imagination. And in 1967, culture and politics were fellow travelers. They can be united again. Third and finally, too often societies are forced to make their biggest decisions in a time of crisis. And crises can be useful. This is why Rahm Emanuel called the current economic crisis in the US a terrible thing to waste. But what I'm talking about today is the exact opposite of a crisis. Our anniversary, again, can be a catalyst. If we roll up our sleeves and get started now, we can make 2017 Canada's next turning point. It can be Canada's next great year. Thank you. <laughs>